Hello, I'm Luis Serrano, and this is Serrano Academy. And this video is about AdaBoost. Ensemble methods are a super useful way to combine a bunch of okay machine learning models into a big, amazing model. And what do I mean by okay models? Well, you'll be surprised, but as long as the models are just slightly better than random chance, they can be combined into a really good model. So if their accuracies are just over 50%, you could cleverly combine them to get a model with really high accuracy. To illustrate ensemble methods, imagine that you have to do a difficult exam and let's say it's a take home exam. So you enlist some friends to help you and let's say that this is allowed, so we're not cheating. In particular, there are two similar methods called bagging and boosting which you can use. Both of them consist of gathering a bunch of friends to help us with the exam questions. We're gonna call our friends weak learners which may sound a little harsh at first, but it's meant to emphasize that our friends don't need to be geniuses to be able to help us do wonderfully well in the exam. In fact, as long as our friends are just slightly better than average, we're good. And here is how bagging works. For bagging, we're going to pick five friends randomly and we are going to make our friends answer the test. Once they've answered, they could be correct or wrong for some of the questions, but that doesn't matter. We're going to combine the answers in some way. It could be done by voting, it could be done by averaging, that part doesn't matter. There's a better way to do it, however, which is boosting, that's the second method. Here, we have a methodical way to pick our friends. So we pick our first friend randomly. Then we make our friend to the exam and we see how they did. Our first friend may have some strengths and some weaknesses. Let's say for example that they're very good at math but bad at geography. No problem, we're going to pick a second friend who is good at geography to take the exam. And let's say we're gonna combine these two tests and we notice that together they did well in math and geography but they did really poorly in biology and physics. So we're gonna pick the third friend to be really good at geometry and physics and so on and so forth. Every time we pick a new friend, we make sure they're good at the weaknesses that all the others have. So that is called boosting. And in this video, I'm gonna show you Ada Boost, which is a very important boosting method in machine learning. Okay, so let's start with this data set that has two labels, the blue triangle and the red square. And the idea is to build a classifier for it, so a model that can tell these two labels apart. So here's a good model, it's the one that builds this boundary between them and classifies everything to one side as a blue triangle and everything to the other side as a red square. Now this is good, but this classifier is too complex, it has a lot of little pieces in the boundary, so it's complicated. Could we do okay with a simple classifier? And by simple classifier, I mean something like one vertical line or one horizontal line. These are some of the simplest classifiers one can build. If you're interested in decision trees, this is a decision tree with only one level. If you'd like to learn more about decision trees, I recommend this video that I have on my channel and it's also linked in the comments. However, weak classifiers don't always have to be decision trees or anything in particular. As long as they're simple, easy to build, and as long as they do a little better than random choice, which is 50%, we'll be able to combine them into a strong classifier. This is the amazing property of AdaBoost. It can turn lousy classifiers into a really good one. So let's build some simple classifiers. And we're gonna call these ones weak learners. We're gonna build weak learners in a clever way. We're gonna start by building one of them. Let's say it's this vertical line over here which classifies everything to its left as a blue triangle and to its right as a red square. Now this classifier is good, but it's not perfect. We're gonna to need to build some more. And this is the idea. Each learner is gonna focus on the weaknesses of the previous ones. What are the weaknesses of this classifier? Well, as you can see, it got most of the points correct, but it made three mistakes, which are these three blue triangles that are classified as red squares. So we're gonna make sure the next classifier focuses on those three points, but first, we are going to store this one over here for later use. So now we're gonna build a new weak learner on this new weighted data set. This new one is forced to focus more on the mistakes. And so let's say it's this horizontal line over here, which actually did well with the three triangles. So this one also missed some point, also made some mistakes. Which ones? Well, there's this red square over here, which was classified as a blue triangle. And there are these two blue triangles here that got classified as red squares. So it made three mistakes, but that's okay. We can amplify these mistakes and then store our classifier for later use. And now we're gonna build a new classifier on these weighted data sets. These better get the big points correct. And this one could be this line over here, which classifies everything to the left as a blue triangle and to the right as a red square. Now we could continue amplifying the mistakes and building a lot of weak learners, but let's say we stop here at three and we store it. So now we have three weak learners to combine. And our final step is just that. 
we combine the three weak learners and get this strong classifier over here. This is the strong learner that AdaBoost builds for us. Now that's the gist of AdaBoost, but there are a few details to iron, such as by how much do you scale the mistakes or how do you combine the classifiers? So that's what we're gonna learn next. So here's how to build each weak learner. Let's start with our data set and to start, we'll assign a weight of one to each one of the points. Then we'll fit a weak learner to this data set. And let's say it's this one over here. Several of them work, but you can't do too well since the data set is a bit more complex than something that can be split with just a horizontal or vertical line. So how good is this one? Well, let's count how many points it classifies correctly and incorrectly. It classifies seven points correctly, which are these blue triangles over here and these red squares over here which are all on the correct side and how many points is classifying correctly these are three the three blue triangles here that are classified as a red square now we're going to rescale the three misclassified points by some factor and the factor is going to be seven over three that's 2.33 so these three points that are misclassified get blown up by a factor of 2.33 and why is the factor seven over three? Because we have seven correct ones and three incorrect ones. So take the number of correct ones divided by the number of incorrect ones. This ratio will become more clear when I talk about the odds later in the video. But for now, let's just say it's the number of correctly classified points divided by the number of incorrectly classified points. So this is our rescale data set. And now we're going to play the same game again in order to build the second weak learner. So we're going to build a second weak learner which fits this data set as well as possible. There's a rescale data set, so there's more emphasis on those big blue triangles. They better get it correctly. And now let's see how well the second week learner did. So we're not gonna count the number of correct points and incorrect. We are going to take the sum of their values. So that's gonna be 11. Why 11? Because there's 2.33 three times and then a one four times. So the sum of the correct values is 11 and the sum of the incorrect values is three because it's this misclassified point over here and these two over here. So now we're gonna blow up the incorrect points by a factor of 11 over three because we have 11 correct and three incorrect. That's 3.67, which means that these three points over here get blown up by a factor of 3.67. And we continue playing the game. This is our new rescale data set. And to this data set, we're gonna fit a new weak learner, it better get those big points correctly. And it's this one over here. So how good is this classifier? Well, now the sum of the correct points is going to be 19 because it's going to be these ones plus these ones. And the sum of incorrect points is gonna be still three because it is three over here. And we can continue scaling and building weak learners, but let's say we choose to stop now. Let's say we only wanted three learners. This is a hyperparameter that we can fine tune using any of our favorite hyperparameter tuning methods. So in this case, we chose to pick three classifiers, but we can pick as many as we want. And here are our three weak learners. The first one had a correct score of seven and incorrect of three. The second one had 11 and three, and the third one had 19 and three. So each one of the learners is associated to a scale data set and also associated to the correct score and the incorrect score. These numbers will be important when it comes to combining these three weak learners into a strong learner, which is what you're gonna learn next. Okay, so now that we have the three weak learners, let me show you how to combine them into one strong learner. The idea is very simple. We're gonna make them vote. In other words, if we have a point over here and we want to know the predicted label, then we simply have to check what label is given to that point by the three weak learners. And the labels given are red for the first one, blue for the second one, and blue for the third one. So that's one red and two blue. So when we make them vote, then we're gonna have that the label is blue. And now we'll do that for every point. So a simple way to do this is to put plus ones in the blue regions and minus ones in the red regions, and then to overimpose the regions, and then look at what are the labels on each one of these regions given by the classifiers. So the first classifier gives a plus one to these regions and a minus one to these ones. The second one gives a plus one to these regions and a minus one to these ones. And the third one, a plus one to these regions and a minus one to these two. And so to know the label of each one of the six regions below, all we have to do is to add the three numbers. And when we get a number that is positive, then we're gonna say that the label is blue. And when we get a label that is negative, then we're gonna say that the label is red. 
and that is how we get the labels for all those six regions. There may be zeros, which means that for those, the classifier doesn't really know if they're red or blue, so we can just assign them randomly. But the good news is that this happens for a very, very, very tiny probability, especially if we have many weak learners. So voting works, but actually the way to combine the classifier is a tiny bit more complicated, but not too much. The idea is to combine them using weighted voting. So what does this mean? It means some weak learners have more of a say than others, and that depends on how well they do. So a weak learner that learned the data really well has more vote than one that's not so good. For that, we need a bit of math, which is coming next. So let's sidetrack a little bit. Let's say that we have a coin and it's a biased coin. So on average, it will return heads three times out of every four tries and tails one time. Of course, it could return anything, but we notice that the probability of heads is going to be three quarters. That's for three heads divided by the four tries. And the probability of tails is its complement. So it's one quarter, that's one tail divided by the four tries. But it turns out that the probability is not exactly what we want here. We want the odds and odds is very similar, except instead of dividing by the total number of throws, we divide number of heads by the number of tails. So the odds of obtaining heads is gonna be three over one. And the odds of tails is going to be the multiplicative inverse, which is one third. That's one tail divided by the three heads. Odds are used a lot in many places, in particular sports. You may have heard things like the odds of winning a particular game or so and so. But let's do some plotting to see how the odds look like. So here we have the odds of heads, which is three. And here we have the odds of tails, which is one third. And we'd love to have something symmetric, but we have a small problem, which is that this is not symmetric. Imagine if the odds weren't three and one third, but instead they were seven and one seventh. If our coin was a lot more biased towards heads than towards tails. And the points are over here. And notice that the sort of center is one. And as we make the coin more biased towards heads, the odds of tails go closer and closer to zero, whereas the odds of heads explodes and goes really, really far away. We say that it converges towards infinity. So that's the problem. What could we do to make this a bit more symmetric so that it's not tiny on the left and gigantic on the right? Well, there is a function that's gonna save us. And the function that's gonna save us is the logarithm. So let's recall, here we have our three, our one third, our seven, and our one seventh. And here is the one, and we have an asymmetry towards the left versus towards the right. Well, no problem. If we take the logarithm, then things change. By the way, I'm taking the natural logarithm, which is the logarithm base E, but we could take the logarithm base anything else. Could be two, could be 10, could be any number you want, and the same thing is gonna hold. Things are gonna get scaled, numbers are gonna change, but the symmetry is not gonna change. So when we take the logarithm, then the one goes to zero because the logarithm of one is always zero. And what happens with three? Well, the logarithm of three is 1.1, and check this out, the logarithm of one third is minus 1.1, so there is symmetry. If we do this for seven, the logarithm of seven is 1.95, the logarithm of one seventh is minus 1.95, so again, there is symmetry. And the reason for the symmetry is that the logarithm of one over x is the negative of the logarithm of x. This is a very popular function, it's called the log odds, and it's also called the logit. It appears everywhere in machine learning, and we're gonna use it to help us combine the classifiers. Okay, so recall that we had our three weak learners over here, each one of them with a number of correct and incorrect points, which was a sum of the values of the correct ones and the sum of the values of the incorrect ones. Now for each one of them, we're gonna calculate not the probability of being correct with a random point, but the odds of being correct. That means that for the first one, we have an odds of seven over three, for the second one, 11 over three, and for the third one, 19 over three. And then we calculate the log odds or the logit. So the values that we get are 0 0.85, 1.3, and 1.85. This will be the quality scores for each of the weak learners. In other words, this is how much vote each one of them has when we combine them. So now with these quality scores, we're going to play the same voting game that we played before. That means we assign 0.85 of the vote to the first weak learner, 1.3 to the second one, and 1.85 to the third one. So what we do is we're gonna multiply these ones and minus ones from before by the quality score of each one of the weak learners. So we're gonna get 0.85 for this ones, 1.3 for the second ones, and 1.85 for the ones corresponding to weak learner number three. And now we're gonna add them like before for the first classifier, 
for the second one and for the third one. And when we add them, we get some values that are positive and negative. When the values are positive, then we're going to say that that region gets classified as blue. And when they're negative, it gets classified as red. And in that way, we combine these weak learners to form a strong learner. And notice that this strong learner does really well because it manages to classify the entire data set correctly. So that's how AdaBoost works. Next thing I'm going to show you is a coding example. So now let's do some code. The example I'm going to show you appears on the GitHub repository linked here in the comments, which you can access for free. This is the repo of my book, Grokking Machine Learning, which contains a whole chapter on bagging, boosting, Adaboost, Random Forest, XGBoost, etc. At the end of the video, you can see a link with a discount code if you'd like to take a look at it. But as I said, the code is accessible by anyone on GitHub. So the code lab, we'd have this data set over here and we're going to fit an Adaboost model to it. And this is very easy with a couple of lines of code. First, we're going to import the Adaboost classifier from the scikit-learn ensemble package. And then we use the function fit. That is all we do. You can also use the function score to see how your classifier is doing. So when we fit the classifier, it does the following. This is the boundary of the resulting strong learner. Notice that it did quite well. It only made a couple of mistakes. But notice something else. There is this parameter here called n estimators, which I set to six. That means that we used six weak learners to build this strong learner, and we can actually see them. These are the six weak learners over here. Notice that the resulting strong learner is a superimposition of these ones. We can see the weights that they have using this estimator weights function. And in this case, they're all round up to one. So indeed, what we get is an over imposition of all the weak learners to create the strong learner. So that's all folks. Thank you very much for your attention. If you like this video, please subscribe to my channel so you can see more content, hit like, share or comment. You can also become a member of my channel by hitting join or you can also support me on Patreon. My videos will always be free for everyone. But if you become a member, you can support me a lot more and you can get some really cool perks such as early access to videos, Q and A's with me and your name on the videos. You can also follow me on Twitter, Serrano Academy, or check out my page, which is serrano.academy, where I have videos, courses, blog posts, etc. And as I mentioned in this video, I have a book called Rocking Machine Learning, and this video today appears on a chapter of the book. If you'd like to get it, there's a link on the comments and a 40% discount code. So thank you very much and see you in the next video.